Hey, welcome back to episode 14 of Turn Bark Time. I'm the Turn. I'm the Bark. And we're going to be here a long time. Welcome back. This is a four content episode, so we're finishing up. We've covered, uh, if you're a student, you've covered sections one and two, three and four, and now I believe we're covering five, six, and seven uh, to be completed. Also, you'll notice on Tuesday, we will drop an escape room for you guys to get a chance to test your knowledge. Uh, if anybody out there wants access to the escape room, we can uh, figure it out. Leave a note in the comments, and we'll see if we you can solve it yourself. So, without further ado, our topic today is going to be uh, Adam's presidency and the election of 1800. And again, if we had the rights to play Hamilton music, we would totally play the Hamilton song because it's one of my favorites. So uh, Washington steps down as president, uh, basically says, I'm not seeking another election. Washington uh, favors this guy, a uh, Roman general named Cincinnatus, who basically, long story short, I'll try and keep it short, was this Roman general who just wanted to farm. He just wanted to hang out. And Romans come when they're being attacked, and like, Cincinnati, we need you. And he's like, nope, I'm a farmer now. It's cool. And they're like, no, 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 like, Rome will fall. Like, we need you. And he's like, okay, fine. He's like, I'll be your leader, but when this is over, I'm not your emperor. I'm not your king. I'm not nothing. I get to go home and farm. So Cincinnati leads the army. Legions, sorry, wins, right? Defeats the enemy. And then they're like, Cincinnati, you're the emperor. And he's like, no, going home to farm. Peace out. I'm going here. Uh... And so Washington idolizes this guy, and, and the reason he idolizes him is somebody voluntarily gives up power, and that was a big thing for him. He, he really idolized that, and he did. He was done leading the nation. He was reluctant to take the job in the beginning, and so now we lead to the election of 1796, I believe. Yes. In 1796, you're going to have Adams defeat uh, Thomas Jefferson— Jefferson gets a lot of his support from the South and the West. Like we've talked about in the past, that's where the farmers are. And then Adams is kind of the, the Federalists tend to be in the North where they're pushing for industrialism and financial institutions like banks. So the big thing about the Adams administration is that Adams is far less popular than George Washington. Um, he has an abrasive personality. People don't like him. They think that he's full of himself. Um, and then we'll see... During his presidency, he – this is where, again, we're stuck in the love triangle. We're at the top, the United States, and then down in the corners are Britain and France. And we're trying to see – you know, we Washington took that neutral stance so we could, like, you know, be friends with benefits with both of them. And then um, people are now concerned that people are immigrating from Europe, and then they're trying to subvert the new U.S. government and make us, you know, do what France wants or do what England wants. And so to prevent that, Adams passes a series of laws called the Alien and Sedition Acts. So it increases the amount of time before you become a citizen. It used to be four years. They bump it to 15. Um, they, if you're an immigrant who's trying to subvert the government, you can be deported or jailed. And then if you're committing sedition, so encouraging rebellion against the government, um, you can also be fined or put in jail. The real reason they were doing this is that the Democratic Republicans bought newspapers like the Philadelphia Aurora, which was run by Benjamin Franklin Bach, um, who would take their information from the French newspapers, and then they would also just launch attacks on John Adams. They called him old. They called him bald. They called him, at one point, I think, hermaphroditical. Um, if that's in the John Adams miniseries that stands out. Because he sits and talks with his wife, and he's like, they would never say that about Mr. Washington. Um, and it's like, well, but you're not George Washington. Yeah. You're not the great unifier. Um, and then there's a bit of a kerfuffle with France where they we send um, Pinckney, I believe, Charles Pinckney over there as a ambassador to try and treat with the new government in France. And they're like, uh, a little money, a little money. In Egypt, they would say a little bekshish. But... Mm -hmm. uh, and he's completely offended and doesn't realize that's that's the new mode of you know government, and comes home and we almost get into a war with France and people in the Federalist Party are pushing Adams saying that come on come on dude they're war hawks like Hamilton's one of them like we've got to stand up we got to protect our got to show them that we're you know they can't just push us around and demand money, and Adams will not go to war. It's one of the things he's very proud of, but 
it won't serve him well coming into the next election. And, and one thing really important to, to specify is Adams gets a lot of the blame for the Alien Sedition Acts because he is the one man who signs his name to the bill to make it into a law. But it is important to realize that, again, whenever we talk about laws being made, we got to remember that's congressional, right? Like Congress is the one who wrote this and passed it. And again, Congress is controlled by Federalists at this time. So their job is to try and subvert this. So things like the Alien Sedition Acts, uh, for the Alien Acts, it actually did eliminate a lot of French spies that were inside the United States trying to uh, ferment dissent uh, against like England and things like that. Um, but what it really targeted and what Jefferson thought was immigrants tended to vote for the Republicans. And so Jefferson was like, well, this is a deliberate attack. You're trying to take people who could vote for me or my party and you're trying to you know, squash them. Um, and then sedition again is, is, was supposed to be like stop inciting rebellion, but it really gets used as a way of like, you're not allowed to say anything bad about Congress, the president, the US government in general. And I think there's 25 arrests are made is all it is. Like it's, it's, it's more of an attempt to like try and threaten rather than actually carry it out. Um, but this will, this will black mark the Adams presidency um, in a major way. But again, like Barker was saying, the biggest pride that, that Adams ever had was that he kept peace. And he didn't go to war with France. And it's actually, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, it's written on his tombstone. Yeah, it's I like think, I think that's like, yeah. It's like here lies John Adams, uh, the man who didn't or who like kept the peace with France or something like that. So and that's actually what um his when he campaigns in 1800, that's what he campaigns on is this idea of peace and prosperity. Like we're not gonna rush into war, wars cost money. You know, I'm I kept the peace, let's keep the country growing. Where Jefferson will run under this idea of essentially pushing for smaller government. You know, we're gonna spend less, we're gonna have a smaller central government. Those were kind of the two platforms going into the election of 1800. So again, like the election of 1800 leads off and uh, as my favorite, uh, again, the favorite song that I have says, uh, they are talking about a bunch of other stuff that's going on, but it's like, can we get back to politics? And uh, Jefferson's, uh, person who plays Jefferson says, I love John Adams, but he pooped the bed. Um, and again, Th John Adams and Thomas Jefferson are actually really good friends um, until their political careers pull them apart. And then again, like we talked about, they will actually reunite after they both kind of leave politics. Um, and kind of come together. So really interesting about that. Uh, so the election breaks down. As you can see, we had 16 states now that could uh, vote in a presidential election that had electoral college votes. We're still on the same ballot system. So everybody, every elector gets two votes. It doesn't matter really what order in, you just vote for two people and then whoever has the most gets to be president, whoever has the least gets to be vice president. But what's interesting about this election is we now have John Adams losing, and he gets 65 electoral votes. The The next one that's in a Federalist is Charles Pickney, who gets 64, and John Jay gets one. Um, Hamilton was actually really anti-Adams, again, for not going to war with France and, and sticking to that Federalist party line. And so he tells everyone to vote for Pickney. He's like, vote for Pickney. He'll he'll listen to me. Like, we'll, we'll get this running. But what's interesting is the Republicans – actually have two candidates that each have 73 votes. It's because somebody screwed up because the way that this is supposed to work during this time period, just like the Federalists did where John Jay got one vote. And the reason for that one vote is so that Adams finishes above Pinckney. Whoever was supposed to get the memo that says, hey, vote for Mickey Mouse, Darth Vader, you know, whoever screwed up. And yep. missed the memo, which led to everybody, essentially every Democratic Republican elector voting the exact same ballot, leading to a tie at 73. And what happens here is is there's two candidates. Jefferson is the obvious choice for presidency, right? There's a guy who's been an ambassador of France, secretary of state. He wrote the Declaration of Independence. Like He's from Virginia. He knows what the frick he's doing. And then you got this upstart, this guy who's like 
been around, but nobody really knows for sure. He's from New York. His name's Aaron Burr. And again, if you know the Hamilton musical, you'll know Burr is this person who's constantly trying to, he's kind of Hamilton-esque in a sense. He's trying to, to lift himself up higher than what his social status is. Where Hamilton does it aggressively and goes for it, Burr actually plays back and holds his cards close to his chest. He doesn't give opinions left or right. And again, the famous line from the song is, uh, you know, Jefferson's mad about that. He doesn't, he's not forthcoming on any particular stances. I think Madison says that. But then Jefferson says, uh, he's like, if they call me a Francophile. At least they know I know where France is. You know, and, and Bird does that because he thinks the best way to play is to play both sides. Right. And, and to, to show this in its entirety, Burr was a Federalist and, and pretty hardcore. And then when he sees an opening to get into Congress, into the Senate, he actually defeats Alexander Hamilton's father-in-law for a Senate seat by calling himself a Republican and switching his viewpoint entirely. Yeah, he's very Machiavellian. He's just like, whatever it takes to win. Um, and you don't really know, in a way, kind of like the current president, like Trump is, if you go back, you can find almost like contradictory statements on almost anything he's ever said, where he's in what, one point said like, no, we shouldn't do this. And then now, like five years later, he's like, no, we're going to do it this way. And as a politician, that can be problematic because people are like, well, either if, if you don't say anything, there's no record of nobody knows where you're at. If you say stuff, say too many things, then it's like, well, you have contradicting evidence. Yep. And so Burr is definitely in that didn't say enough. And you would argue that Hamilton says too much. Right. Exactly. So. When there's a lack, when you don't, when nobody wins the majority of the elector, electoral votes, it goes to a contingent election, which means the election is decided by the House of Representatives. Going back to the old Articles of Confederation style, that every state gets a single vote. So the vote for the contingent election is out of 16 votes because there's the original 13 colonies plus Vermont, Tennessee, and Kentucky are the new three, so they're 16. 13 plus 3, 16. Um, and it comes down the first 35 ballots. This happens over six days, almost a week. Um, Jefferson will get eight votes. Burr gets six. And then two states return a ballot with, like, they essentially abstain. Blank. And be, their, only, their only options are Jefferson or Burr. So they know that the Democratic Republicans are going to win. There, there's no hope for the Federalists. They got they they both lost. You know, Adams and Pinckney had less votes than 73. So what happens is they essentially kind of like Hamilton's even he's not running for president because he he kind of runs into political ruin with his personal life, makes a bad decision, and then essentially outs himself to the public. The Democratic Republicans are threatening to out him. And he like he says in the musical, he essentially self-destructs. You know, like he he's the one that sends out like all of his dirty laundry and says, "Yeah, I cheat on my wife. Here's everything." And you know, I'll never he'll never be president because of that indiscretion. Uh, but he still holds sway in the Congress, and so he begins writing letters trying to sway the Federalists on who they should support. Well, and and so the big thing to point out here is the from the Republican standpoint. People thought Burr would just bow out. He would say, hey, like one person don't – one state don't vote for me or vote – put all your votes to Jefferson, right? But Burr, again, seeking that uh, socioeconomic gain, right, and that, that public status gain, uh, just stay silent, which is true to his form. And so he doesn't bow out of the election just on the hope that you know people get frustrated enough and just vote him in. Right. Because there are Federalists out there who have the mindset. And this is a mindset that we have in elections today where people are like anybody but this candidate. And, and that's what they view. They're like anybody but Jefferson. I'm going to vote for Burr. I don't, I don't care if he's a Republican. Anybody but Jefferson. And and Hamilton actually writes and it's in the song, too, is that. Jefferson has beliefs. Burr has none is the quote from the song. And then he goes on to say, I fought with Jefferson on every single thing, right? Him and I disagreed everything politically, not one thing we agreed on. And he goes, but he goes, I would rather have somebody who is willing to display their beliefs and their convictions than somebody who hides them, because that's more dangerous than somebody not telling or telling us what they believe and we disagree with it. 
And so on the 30, 36th ballot, what happens is Jefferson will receive 10 votes. He needs nine, which is half, over half, one over half. Um, Jefferson receives 10. Burr receives four ballots, actually loses two ballots, um, and then there's two that are turned in blank. Those would be, those would have been, um, those were South Carolina and Delaware who initially had voted for Burr, but because Hamilton swayed the Federalists, they couldn't, they were tied, they were deadlocked. They were like two and two or like four and four. And so they, they said, we can't come to a conclusion. We have to turn in an abstention. Okay. And that paves the way for Thomas Jefferson. And in the song, they say, it's crazy the guy that comes in second gets to be vice president. And then it goes, ooh, you know what? We can change that. You know why? Why? Because I'm the president. <laughs> is what Jefferson is Jefferson's line from the song. So in 1804, that leads to the? The Twelfth Amendment to the Constitution, which what which will prevent a tie from like this ever happening again. So now, right again, like so Hamilton and Pickney run as partners basically. Like it's thought that if or not Hamilton, my apologies. If Adams and Pickney win, it's thought that Adams will continue being president. Pickney will be vice president. And then again, the thought is Jefferson's our presidential candidate for the Republicans. Burr is our our vice president. And so to prevent this from ever happening again, we pass an election that basically says electors will now vote for um, the vice president on one ballot and the president on the other ballot. Um, and so this is the system that we continue to this day. Uh, it does actually make a slight change to our constitution as well um, with a little bit more, which I found interesting when I was doing some digging. Uh, so if this ever happened again, there was no majority, this would go to the House of Representatives. However, the vice presidential election would go to the Senate because the vice president is the president of the Senate. And so they they would get to control the vice presidency, which you think would tow party lines. But if different houses can or if different parties control different houses, it would be interesting to see what, what were to happen. So so that's kind of our our last. Oh, good. And that contingent vice presidential election is limited to the top two vote getters in the primaries. So that would essentially be the like in, a, in our current system, the top Republican and the top Democrat. Um, another interesting thing that I saw, because I, I started, we got in, I got into that and I started digging, Ooh. is that the idea like today, like you have Trump and Pence who picked, you know, Pence, well, Trump picked him. Candidates since the 60s have gotten to pick their vice presidential candidates. But before that, they were pretty much um, chosen by the political parties. It wasn't a matter of personal preference. And so I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. And up until I think it was 67, that's when it was ratified, the 25th Amendment, there was no contingency for adding a vice president if we lost the vice president during their term. Oh, really? And, and I, this is something we don't talk about very much. Uh, I didn't check the math on this. So this could this is from yeah. some very basic research. Somebody said that we have spent 37 years of our national history without a vice president because we've had seven die in office. Yep. We've had, it says one, it's one or two resign. Okay. And then we've had eight ascend to be the president because the president passed away. Right. But up until 65, 67, yeah. There was no legal way of replacing the vice president. Huh. And so the office just went unfulfilled. Yeah. I think there were people who might have served as the vice president, but they didn't technically get Hold sworn in and become a new vice president. But when we talk about the vice presidency, we're talking about one of the, I, I'm sorry I, to use this term, but figurehead style jobs, right? You're the man in waiting or woman in waiting when that day comes. Um you know, you get to break ties in the Senate, you know, when necessary and things like that. But but overall, like your job description is you're not very powerful. You're <laughs> very much like a, a cheerleader. You're there to kind of do what the president needs you to do. And, and that's that. So John Adams called it the like most useless position ever created by man. And you know, he's the first vice president of the United yeah. States. So that really, really says this job rocks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thumbs up, man. Uh, and uh, I mean, so so that's kind of our take on this. It's it's again, if you get the opportunity, you know, Lin Manuel Miranda did an amazing job writing 
Hamilton. And, and if you ever get a chance to to listen to it or go see it or even read the book, uh, highly recommend it. Um, so, uh, anything else to add on this one? No, I think it's it's pretty much we've wrapped it up. Give everybody a little sense of home here. A little bow. Oh, a little, little shout out. Yep, to the Quincy School. That's right. <laughs> it's like the middles behind the tree, yeah. but you know that it's. Yep. Yeah. So uh, anyway, looking forward to to teaching online this week. Again, be on the lookout uh, Tuesday. We're gonna drop an escape room for you guys to do. Um, see if you can get out, see if you learned everything from, uh, this chapter. So, and again, if you're watching at home and you want to try our escape room, we're more than welcome to, to try and send it to you, um, in a, a unique format. So, uh, next time we're going to drop a video on Thursday. That's going to be all about federalism because we're in a unique time where, um, we're going to talk about who has the power to tell who, what, and then, uh, how different parties react to, to that, um, statute. So, uh, until next time, I'm Turn. I'm the Bard. And we're going to be here a long time. Good night, everybody. Stay safe. And be well. <laughs>